Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today and ready for a fall season of the Channel Marketing Academy. And for our chat today, uh, we are going to be talking about trade show best practices and follow ups. And I'm very excited to start the season with three uh, experts. We have Adriana, Jens, and Julia, who are here to talk to us today about their experiences and how they do it. Um, but before I let them introduce themselves, I wanted to say a huge thank you to the Partner Marketing Group for keeping the lights on here and letting us do this every month because sharing is caring. So uh, they allow you to keep watching this for free every month. Um, please ask questions. I know I say this every time, but I'm gonna say it again. Uh, put it in the chat, ask your questions. Please, um, keeping this as interactive as possible is is why we do this. And, you know, if you want to be crazy and come off mute and show your face, you are more than welcome to do that, too. Asking a question live is uh, always invited and appreciated. And because um, I am focusing on asking questions, checking the chat at the same time, you know, sometimes I miss stuff as we're going through it. Michelle and Anya will keep me honest. And uh, if there's any, if I've forgotten anything, they will definitely uh, come off mute and say hello. So without further ado, Adriana, why don't you kick us off and tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you for having me here. It's great to be here. Um, my name is Adriana DeVito. I've been in the Microsoft Dynamics space for just over 13 years in various uh, sales and marketing roles uh, for a couple of ISVs and consulting firms as well. Jens, what about you? Am I pronouncing your name correctly? So, uh, almost correctly, yeah. <laughs> almost, I knew it. <laughs> almost I knew perfect, it. I'm sorry. That's good. That's good almost, enough. Anna. Oh no, no, no. Okay. All right, Introduce hello, people properly and yeah. with you. <laughs> That's okay. So my name is uh, I'm Jens um, from Belgium. Uh, probably hear that from my accent. I don't have the the perfect English accent, so sorry for that. Um, I'm responsible um, for Dynavision, which is in the ISV that mainly focuses on business central add-ons for distribution, retail and the drink sector. Um, I've been uh, in the role for about a, a year and a half and we are uh, just really going uh, going to market. So these are exciting times for us. And I'm happy to, uh, to be here and tell you guys a bit more on how we are preparing for the trade show that are coming up. There you are. And everybody has an accent just depending where your your center <laughs> is. True. So it, it's really, it's it's a perfect Belgian accent. And last but definitely not least, the other Julia Roberts. Um, uh, take it away. Oh, still uh, on mute. I'm sorry, my dog was snoring. And so <laughs> I was trying to stop that. So I'm sorry if you hear him. Um, I'm Julia Roberts, as you know, not that Julia Roberts Roberts. Um, I have been with Argonne & Co. for part-time for about almost, I don't know, 14 or 15 years. So I have my own um, small business, um, but I really feel like one of their employees because um, they let me be. So I get to go to um, all of their events and I plan all of their trade shows and all of their marketing efforts for here and in Brazil. So. Very cool. And thank you for, for coming on and talking talk to us today. So let's kick this off now. Um, how do you choose which trade shows to go to? How do you pick which ones? Um, Adriana, how about you kick us off? Hey, thank you, Tanya. Uh, specifically for this uh, Microsoft Dynamics space, uh, there are the go-to events that everyone is pretty much already aware of. Um, you've got, of course, Summit, you've got uh, directions for the partners. But having said that, companies now, even specifically ISVs, they might want to start branching out to specific verticals, um, in which case they're going to want to go outside of the Microsoft Dynamics space. And that's where the question is really important, Tanya. Um, you know, which ones do you go to? There, just, there are many. Uh, they, they're expensive. You know, you're talking about taking valuable resources and time and investing to go. So one thing you want to do, if there's something that's on the radar, is determine, OK, is this the correct target market for our group? Um, and um, I would say before investing in even, a, even the lowest level sponsorship, 
you go boots on the ground and you go visit. Uh, you bring your marketing person and or a salesperson. I would say both make, as a tag team. So they'll both be looking at different aspects of the venue and the event um, and assess it from there. Go see it, go visit, go ask questions of the sponsors who are already investing um, and ask them what kind of uh, value they're getting from the event. Uh, you'll also want to see uh, what kind of exposure you get value for dollar. Um, various sponsorships. Is it is it something that's prohibitively expensive? Um, if you're also at an ISV, for example, and you're um, you know looking, you're ERP agnostic, and you're saying, well, we're working in Microsoft Dynamics, we will look at NetSuite, what have you. Um, is is it something that it's it's something you can play in their field, or do they make it? challenging and expensive to deal with them on a regular basis. You really want to investigate um, what it's like to partner with the various organizations you want to work with. I would say that's number one. And uh, I don't know if someone else wants to add to that. Sure, um, maybe I'll, uh, I'll chime in. Um, because well, of course we, we are an ISV at Division, So for us, it's also important to make sure we are at the right uh, trade shows. We are still in uh, some sort of startup phase. So uh, I'd say that uh, also our budget is very important. We have to make sure that it is uh, for us possible uh, budgetary wise to visit certain trade shows. For example, I'd love to visit North America um, and directions over there uh, for, for example, uh, other summits, but of course the budget is quite high for those opportunities. So we start with just going to uh, the trade shows that are a bit more near to us. Uh, so we are going to directions EMEA um, at the moment. Also, because of course, uh, all of our targets are there. So it's uh, for us, it's a perfect match to go to the trade shows where uh, other Dynamics partners will be present. Uh, and we also try to go to other trade shows um, where some of our partners are. So we have um, partners who implement our software, but we also have partners uh, for which we create software. For example, we have uh, Elf Squad, which is CPQ software. They recently had an, uh, an event in the Netherlands where we also went with a few people uh, just to make sure we uh, get our relations uh, right so we can talk to people who are using our uh, our software as well, so end users. So that's also something we try to do is really go to the, the end user sometime instead of uh, first going via the, uh, the partner. And then, of course, also, uh, as uh, Adriana said, verticals are also important. There are some trade shows in Belgium uh, or many trade shows that are, are concerning the, uh, the drinks industry because we are quite known for our beers as well here and the, uh, the alcohol industry, to be honest. So that's mm -hmm. also why we try to be present so we can get our products across that are focused on the, on the drink sector. So I'd say it's, uh, it's mainly uh, it's budget. It's uh, making sure you get the right people over there. Those are two important things, of course. Um, uh, and I guess also which markets we are going to focus on. So when we are going to a new market, we try to look for the best trade shows in that market or region uh, and then present ourselves over there. No, I, so many good things. And to start with Adriana, the we cannot forget to have those different perceptions of when we go to a trade show, because myself as a marketer versus someone in sales, they might have very different outlooks on what they're looking for and things like that. And also, Jens, to your point, uh, around making sure you're meeting the right target market. These things are expensive, like not just the initial sponsorship. It's the booth. It's the Chotskys. It's the t &E that goes along with all of that as well. We can't forget that when we're building out our budget. And it's so important that we're making sure that we're getting the most bang for our buck and what is our objective of going to these events. Like what you said around, okay, well, these ones are for partners and these ones are for end users. Sometimes just having someone in your booth talk to you, you that said, I get more out of like just speaking to someone at a booth for 15 minutes than I could on a 30 minute call sometimes. So absolutely, I think we have to keep that into account when we're going to these trade shows as well, so. Can um, I add one thing that um, absolutely that was different? So yeah. they covered um, absolutely budget, all of those things. I think for us, because we are in many markets, um, not just for Community Summit, um, we have a rating system. We use one, two, three, four, and it changes each year based on um, our initiatives, our strategy. And so we keep our trade show list going, ongoing. Every year we update the deadlines. We look at the speaking engagements. That might be a priority this year for um, somebody be, to be thought as a thought leader, that kind of thing. So we have a rating system. Um, we give it and it changes. 
So I was just going to add that it's good to just keep up with updating a trade show list overall for your entire company. Love that. And I think we, we, that's such a good point to update it every year because we get used to going to the same events because they did well for us a couple of years ago or they're fun. Let's call a spade a spade. But that doesn't mean that they're still a top priority. Our markets change. The reason why we go to these shows change. So I love the idea that you uh, update every year and keep adding to that list. And maybe one that wasn't on the list or low on the list gets higher up or you do something else to support it or just have someone go to to check out if it's worth going back in the future. So um, hot tip everybody um, for today. So we were before we started talk before we started recording, we we're talking about we're either always in planning mode or recovery mode from an event. So how far in advance do we start planning uh, for trade shows? And uh, in the chat, you know, start writing. Are you in planning mode or recovering mode? Uh, I feel like trade show season is just about um, to start. So let us know there. So um Julia, how about you kick us off there? How how far in advance do you start planning? Well, in a perfect world, it's over a year. In our world, which um, is probably the majority of us, it's a little bit less. Um, ideally, we like to do a year because of the opportunity for speaking engagements and booth placement. Sometimes you can get a better area or sponsorships that are more important to you. And so um, we like a year, but that doesn't always work out. Um, I had a time where we had two weeks notice because we were waitlisted. And so you kind of have to, you know, pull things that you've done before. You have materials, that kind of thing that you can reuse. Um, but for us, it is, for marketing department anyways, really four months out. And mm -hmm. then um, I would say that our sales team gets involved about seven weeks out. <laughs> And then they're thinking about deadlines at that time. So I would say in the seven to, you know, two weeks out, I really have their input. I can get their attention, those kinds of things. Uh, that's so important that we have our timelines and then we have to keep in mind all the other people and all the other stakeholders that go to events. But we forget that like, people don't realize how much planning goes into these things. So four months before we know it, we're, we're in the booth. So um, very, very good points. Yes. Do you have anything to add there? Yeah. We also uh, try to start a year in advance. Um, so for us, it starts when the, uh, when a conference ends, then we uh, reevaluate it, look at the things that went good, uh, bad, what we could, what could improve. And then we uh, just make sure we put that down in our notes and then we, um, three to four months before the uh, next event, we start with uh, the planning. So we then take our notes from the from last time and try to uh, make sure we get a, a better concept this time. Um, I'm also very lucky to be uh, supported by a great marketing team with some people who are really, uh, who are focused on the, um, for example, the marketing before the event, making sure we get out the right social media posts, uh, mainly on LinkedIn, make sure we get our uh, ads running uh and then uh, an events team that also helps us prepare the booth so uh to make sure we have enough stopping power and get people to uh, uh to stop by the booth so i'd say three to four months and also we need that time sometimes to order certain things we want to uh, give away at our booth for example or if we would uh would need um yeah some uh, some banners and things like that sometimes it just takes a while to get these things delivered so that's why we try to start uh three to four months in advance and for now it has been uh been perfect for us uh always had enough time to prepare um we always i think we finish a month before uh the event starts without all our preparations oh that's great yeah i think we forget how long sometimes just getting designs in uh if we want to do a special chotsky of some sorts having that delivered to us from a, another area so no all those things we we definitely have to keep in track and i think three to four months is is like you're really you got your mojo going and ready to go. And uh, I really like the fact that you debrief afterwards and you learn for the upcoming year because that it makes you, sometimes you clear your cash. A lot of times I may clear my cash after an event and be like, what happened there again? What were the pros and cons? So by doing it right away and keeping it in your folder, um, that definitely helps to 
messaging, who to target for, for the upcoming year. So very cool. So we talked a little bit about it, but let's go into a little more detail on what are the steps you guys do to ensure the success of an event? Because if we're investing in it, we want to make sure that it's success, a success or as much as we can control that the event is going to be success. So Adriana, why don't you let us know what you do? Gosh, um, already some really good points. Um, so I think to maximize your ROI on this really significant investment, you have your pre-show planning and activities, and then your post-show activities that are both vitally important on both sides. Um, so for pre-show, I would say, and this was already brought up, plan early. You know, the sooner you are aware you're doing the event, sometimes you don't have notice um, but if you have at least a year out start planning at that point and in planning that means um, you know determining your messaging um, themes promotion themes can be you know dependent on what your products are you know it can be tied into what you guys do it could also be tied into where the show is taking place for example you know some of this year is in San Antonio so you're seeing a lot of Southwestern themes with, we've got some armadillos floating around our collateral um, and cactus or cacti. Um, so you want to discuss the themes. So you also want to, um, you know, talk about what are you going to be showing off in your, in your booth? If you have a session, what are, what are your key points that everyone is going to be talking about? You have to um, be cohesive about that. And one way to do that, and somebody put this in comments, so true, you know, a debrief book, um, Lauren, who works with us here at Lanham, she's incredible, detail-oriented, an absolute jewel. Um, she does a debriefing book before every show so that everybody in the company, the team that's attending the event, is aware of the key events, the keynotes, what session we're doing, where sessions, um, what, we're sponsoring, what we're sponsoring, um, what to talk about in the booth, key messages. So everybody's on the same page and you go in there as a cohesive team with cohesive messaging. Um, so also, also, if you're going to be demoing, make sure you've tested your demos and you have a lot of good connectivity in the booth. Uh, very important. Um, and I would say going post-event, and this was already touched on, but we can dive into more detail, is um, load up all the contacts, get them into your CRM, ASAP, clean up the data, um, and connect with people who have reached out to you as soon as possible. So with your marketing messaging, but also, you know, if you're salespeople, whoever met with people in the booths, have them reach out even by phone. You know, it used to be that no one would answer phones, but phones have become such an infrequent way of contacting people. People are actually inclined to answer sometimes. So I would say, you know, reach out to your contacts as soon as possible and, you know, have those contacts in your CRM and um, use that data to create your follow-up collateral as well. Um, and also, I think someone already mentioned, just maybe it was your yourself, Julia, you know, doing a postmortem right away before the team all goes home after the event, do a postmortem post and talk about, you know, what you did well, where you can improve and so on. That's my list so far. That, that, that's a good list. And I, I hope everyone was taking notes or else you can listen to the recording after. But I, I think that having that same messaging is so important. There's nothing that gives me the ache more than you're sit, standing in a booth giving a <laughs> Uh, a talk and then you listen over to someone you're like oh what is they saying so it's so important to have that planning beforehand and those talk checks ready so that you're all focusing towards that same call to action so very very key there julia anything uh you do more differently um tell us a bit about yeah. your experience i would just i mean uh, those are excellent points and i don't really have much to add except for um day of and uh, of show we have a schedule. We try to get attendees. If we reach out to people we know are going to be there, we try to see when they would want to come see us at our booth, a particular person um, at our company. So we do try to make sure our booth has really good coverage with a different um, area of expertise at certain times. So, uh, and I bring that up because I have one client who didn't show up one morning and I was manning the booth, which is not good. And, <laughs> and, um, and so they had a line of people waiting to talk to me and they were late to their booth. So I'm very stickler, <laughs> very much a stickler about schedules. And also I have a rule that they can't sit down. So we don't have chairs. Um, 
We don't have a six foot table. We have a high top so they can stand and it's comfortable to to set the things on. And there's something that um, if somebody, a guest comes in, they can sit down. Um, so we try to make it so that people feel welcome uh, to come in, but also that whoever is there is um, available to talk about what they want to. So we do some pre-show marketing on that. Oh, super important. I think we we almost forget about the day of and how we present ourselves and how we project ourselves. If everyone's just talking to each other on their phones and ignoring kind of what's going on around them, you're you're missing out or that doesn't make it inviting to come into our show. So for sure, uh, making sure that everyone is on at their best and having the right people in the in your little booth because yeah no one wants me to give a demo of anything either or if they do it will be like here's the home page and <laughs> smile and nod and pass it off to somebody else so I totally understand about having the right people or at least someone who can you know talk more technically towards something as well so um thank you um this is when I take a commercial break and I say thank you to our sponsors, the Partner Marketing Group. Um, they are an experienced marketing team solely dedicated to the technology channel. So their marketing solutions, services, programs are specifically designed for you guys in mind. They have the experience in this world and they are designed to drive customer engagements across multiples of channels. And, you know, if you need help planning your next event, or your upcoming year, um, they are here to help plan, talk through, execute uh, your marketing strategy with you. So um, I, if you want to just get a sampling, if you want to know where you fit from a, a marketing perspective, I think we all wonder um, how others are doing, even though we say we're not supposed to compare, we all do. Um, there's a benchmark and, tra uh, and trends report. Go download it. It's on the most um, focused benchmarks in the industry uh, to help you see where you fit and also keep attending our monthly chats because this too will give you a good idea of what's going on in the market. So thank you again, Partner Marketing Group uh, for keeping our lights on or our, our website up. So uh, we can keep going. Oh, we have a question. Um, we'll start with there before we jump into the next um, set of questions. If you are an ISV, which events are you prioritizing to attend? User conferences or partner focused? Um, anyone want to jump in on that one? I, I was sure I'd like to jump okay. in on that one as, as of course, as we are an ISV. Um, so I think it also kind of depends on the stage your ISV is in. Uh, at the moment, we are quite new to the market and we are really looking for, uh, for partners to start uh, selling and using our software so that's why we are at the moment we are mainly focused on uh, events where um, possible partners uh, will be at and where we can convince them to join our Dynavision network um, but I see that changing in the future once we have uh, enough partners who are already uh, are using our software then I think we would go over to the, uh, the end user uh, and see if we can link up our partners and those end users with each other uh, so we can create some, uh, some communal business Super great points. I think the the first question you have to ask Carol to to your client is, well, what is your original goal here? Do you need to build your partner network, or do you need to go after any, or or do you have to help your partner network feed them with with more leads and stuff like that? And I think that'll answer the question for you. I know it's super annoying that you have to. You, they ask you a question, then you turn it around and use the Una reverse card and ask them right back. But it really is the the way that you can have a better understanding of what is your your end goal here. And it, it's another marketing tactic. We say this all the time when we're talking about other marketing tactics out there. This is just one other spoke in your wheel or whatever other um, expression you want to use there. Yes. Yes. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Sorry. I'll just talk. Yeah. Like. Just go, um, it's, please. 
So, so I, I get excited about that topic because, you know, Jens, it's, it's, it's an exciting place where you're at, where you're, you've got this, this great solution and you're trying to expand your, your network. And I think to, in this space, particularly or in any other space, you have to do both. And that's where you have to really manage your marketing and trade show dollars really well, because you do want to, you know, if you go to the user groups and or summit, you know, you have all the users there, you have prospects, you have partners, other ISVs. And I think if I speak on behalf of ISVs and partners, we're all kind of focused heavily on the users, you know, getting, it's our chance to see your clients in person and, you know, talk to them. Um, whereas if you go to a partner focused event, that's where everyone, you know, the partners, the ISVs, everyone's really focused on, okay, what's new? at Dynavision, what are you guys doing? What are you up to? There'll be more of that focus on the ISVs and what you're doing, and you can build that network with the partners. So you kind of have to make sure you're doing at least a set a, a trade show for each um, grouping per year, ideally, if you can. Oh, definitely. We, we don't want to isolate. And I think we forget sometimes that our partner network is as important, if not more important than sometimes our end users, depending on on what we're trying to do with our business. So thank you, Carol, for that question. And um, I'm going to keep going. We touched upon it a little bit already, but we'll, we'll dive a little deeper into this. So what's important to do in your booth? How do you plan booth setup, theme? Is there anything specific that you do um, when you're doing your planning around this stuff? So... Jens, I'll start with you. All right. Um, so, um, well, this time we start uh, with a big brainstorm with our marketing department. So we had, uh, I think, the 10 or 12 people uh, chiming in, everyone throwing their ideas uh, into the group. And then we decided on a, a theme. And once you have a, a theme for your booth, you can start really planning uh, around that that one theme. Um, so... What's important there is that you also you pick something that is quite relevant to, of course, the the trade show um, directions. It's for us. It's most of the times quite easy to to pick a theme that is really linked to what is what is happening there at the moment. Uh, and then we try to get creative with that theme. So make sure that we are not just uh, thirteen in a dozen. That we are not just an, another ISV, but we try to make it make it fun and creative. So um, that's what we have done uh, for uh, the upcoming directions EMEA uh, in uh, Vienna. Or in uh yeah um and what's also important there is to make sure you have enough stopping power because uh, as i mentioned before we are uh, we are quite new to the game we don't have the budget to become a gold or platinum sponsor so we uh, we get pushed somewhere in a in a corner far 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 away from where everything is happening so we make sure that we um, have a theme and uh, a concept that really that creates some kind of buzz it's some uh, type of guerrilla marketing we try to apply to uh, to the trade shows to make sure people just they talk about us and that when they uh, walk by the booth they be sure to stop when they see what's uh, what's happening at our booth so that's what uh, what we have been focusing on, on at the moment and uh, I do believe we have a great concept at the moment so I'm very curious uh, to try it out at the uh, at directions in Maya. I'm very excited to watch on social media. What are you guys going to post? Um, yes, you should follow I, us on uh, LinkedIn I, then. <laughs> I, I will be following you guys for sure. I I think stopping power is such a great word for it um, on how do you get that buzz? And we get overpowered and they put babies in the corner and they have the big booth for the, for the once the big bucks um, when it comes to marketing. So any kind of way that we can be extra creative. And I think it's getting harder and harder. We, we People have gotten used to, okay, if I make eye contact with this person, they're going to stop and talk to me. So we have to make it inviting. And I think that's so, such an important piece. And, and it's not just, okay, like, okay, what we're going to talk about, but how do we... How do we reel them in to for them to say hello? Because that is a big blocker when we're at these events and they're so overwhelmed with everything around them. So um, I will definitely be following and I hope everyone else will be too because um, that that was a good teaser. I'm I'm excited. So um, and uh, Adriana, what do you guys do in your in your booth? Well, I really, really love what Julia said earlier about um, making sure that the the booth team is staffed. You know, we can do you could do a schedule, uh, making sure that they're there and they're 
you know, open to receiving um, so there are customers effectively, you know, trade show booths are like retail space. So you want to be as inviting as, as possible without scaring them away with eager smiles, particularly <laughs> that could happen to you, right? Um, so it's really about uh, making sure you have a schedule so that there's never any lack of staff within the booth. Um, we've also got a super creative idea going on for our booth. It's a, uh, it's a scanning competition. That's all I'll say, <laughs> but I, I want to compete with Jen's teaser. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you're, you know, you're right, Jen, sometimes, you know, you could be a really big fish in a big pond or a little pond, but um, it's not necessarily the biggest fish that get all the attention, you know, through being creative with your giveaways um, and your interaction with the people and including social media, how is the social media supporting your, your theme as well. Um, that'll get you a lot of attention. Um, so uh, that was, I think that was my long answer to the question. <laughs> That's okay. We, we like long, long answers here. And uh, it's true. We didn't talk much about social media because it seems to be a given in this day and age that, okay, well, you're going to have some kind of social media campaign, but I definitely see an uptick on my LinkedIn when there's an event going on or there's a conference or something like that. So I, I don't think we should, I, I think everyone kind of gets into it more, a little more in that time of day. You're outside of your, your usual day-to-day -day stuff. So um, don't forget about your social media or don't underestimate it. Just say, meet us at booth, so-and-so, um, come, come by and, and really try to engage with people and uh, let them have a little bit of FOMO at the same time is, is always good. I think we lost Julia. Oh no. Um, so we will try and get her back and until then we'll, we'll keep the, the party going. So, um, we might need a pinch hitter. People watching right now, we need questions and comments where we're missing someone. So if anyone wants to come in and pinch it, you are more than welcome to um, there. So what are your most important post-show follow-ups that you do? We talked about it about before, but let's go into a little more, more detail there. Adriana, do you have any specifics that you want to go through? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, as mentioned earlier, you know, the pre-show planning is super critical, but the post-show follow-up is is almost as, if not more important. Um, you know, you've you've had a chance to to network or somehow interact with with countless partners and prospects and some of your clients. Um, ideally you've got notes, you 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 want to get that information from your booth staff, the salespeople, the demo people, whoever were there. Um, get them into your CRM, and from there you can start your your you know targeted contact. Reach out as soon as possible. Don't forget you're not the only people that they visited, so um, everybody's going to go back home and they're going to be inundated with messaging. So if you have any kind of data that your folks have collected by their interactions and discussions in the booth, in sessions, in the hallway, uh, make sure that gets into the it's noted into the CRM so you can do some targeted. Follow ups. You can create targeted campaigns, but even better, you know, follow up. Say, hey, following our discussion on X, Y, Z, we're just following up, and it's personalized approach. So follow up, follow up, follow up, mm. and do it quickly. Yeah, I think that the timeliness of of that is so important. Like you said, we're getting bombarded. It's drinking out of the fire hose after the event. So how do you get that top of mind awareness and really start that conversation before other people jump in? Because that people go back to their regular lives really quickly afterwards. So it's so important that you get that first touch in there. And Julia, I don't, are you, <laughs> I, we were worried we lost you there for a second but sorry um, my power my power went out no, so no. i'm just on a cell service right now no um, problem we appreciate yeah, I, your commitment to the chat yeah, sorry so. <laughs> um i don't know where we were i think we were talking about post show how to turn you know um warm or even cold leads into solid leads or at least a conversation and i think um consistency uh i know for us um our uh, our partners have a hard time remembering that um, even a touch point a few times a year, even if somebody is not ready to buy now or even talk about buying um, our services, 
then I, I think that if they know that you are what you do and they know that you're relevant to what they need, um, a consistent marketing schedule. Um, I think um, I think too often people do the follow up email and then they don't hear from them. And then the next time they talk to them is a year from now when they're going. And so I don't necessarily think that's a very good uh, way to do it. Um, and to everyone's a point, I think that um, consistent follow up is going to be helpful. Yes. Put that everyone on your list. Hallelujah. Consistent follow up. I think that it goes for anything in marketing or any kind of lead gen that we try to do that continuous touch point that I don't, I mean, maybe did myself a bit, but it used to be seven touches before someone would actually take action on something. I don't know how many we're up to now, uh, but that consistent, don't throw out, don't say that it was, it wasn't good until you had that consistent follow-up, especially in the ERP industry where, sales cycles are long and convincing people to make the switch is long. And especially if we're working through a partner, so you have to convince the partner that you're, that you're a good like addition to follow. And then on top of that, then they go and market. So we, we're looking at long plays here. So uh, someone we met at a trade show last year, um, you know, you have to be consistent and, and maybe the, the next year they'll come by your booth and then they'll be ready. So um, let's not, let's not toss away all those things too quickly. Um, good point, Julia. Um, okay. So before you move on, oh yeah, I was, yeah, go, go, I was go. going to see if Julia or Jen said it. Cause I forgot to say it. I think we touched on it earlier. Um, before everyone goes home, you know, your, your, your team, your colleagues uh, do a postmortem while it's still fresh in people's minds, you know, take notes on uh, what went well, what needs to be improved, um, really, really critical before everyone gets on the plane and heads home, because then you forget and you get busy. Um, so postmortem before everyone goes home is is uh, very helpful. Yes, yes, no, we, we need our retros so we can understand better of what we need to fix for next year. And I think when we are all tired and exhausted and, and overwhelmed and underslept, that is the perfect moment to find out what really get, get the real information out of people. So um, good, good point. Yeah. Um, Maybe I'll yeah. have something to add as well, if that's no, okay. Um, absolutely. Because uh, I think lots of uh, companies also tend to be very pushy after a certain event. They try to call people dozens of times and send them uh, lots and lots of emails, but that doesn't really work. I think you should, as uh, Julia said, be consistent. Make sure you you uh, get a few touch points in and make sure you send them relevant content instead of just um, doing a mass mailing to all your prospects, or to all the people you've met at the event, because those, those things don't really work anymore. You have to make sure you know uh, what type of content to send to those people. And then when they're ready for it or when they have, uh, for example, when one of our partners has a lead, then they will come to us to talk about it, but they they won't do it proactively because that's not really how it how it works. They they, they all work with um, many other ISVs. So um, yeah, it's very easy to be one of those pushy ISVs and then they won't like you anymore. Also, that's very important, of course. You have to make sure people like you. Uh, and make sure you don't waste your time with your uh, with content that might not be relevant. I think that it, the content being relevant is even more important today than ever before because we do get bombarded and we don't know. Like, we expect people to know exactly what we want at this point. So to, to I think it was Ajana's point earlier about getting those copious notes from the sales team of like what they said and what they did so that you can segment them right right away and not have that say it and spray it mentality is super important so that we can say consistent and then, you know, restart the year after that. So all, I hope everyone has been taking notes because you guys are getting ready for your event season. Um, and now the, I think every marketers, you know, chagrin and what we're asked to do on every year. And cause you know, this is all marketing is, is, um, what is your favorite swag giveaway ever? <laughs> um, I, I think that's always something that people, uh, we sometimes put a little too much emphasis on, like we see of all these other things and we get the whole, uh, we want people to stop by our booth and what gets us to stop. But um, 
how do we how do we walk that line between being too cheesy and that Chotsky laden driven excitement? Where where how do we fit in everything? And then everyone in the chat, please put in your favorite Chotsky item as well. Um, because we all know that we have them. Um, the adult trick or treaters, yes, <laughs> um, we all know them, love them, and um, how do we deal with that? So, um, and let's start with you. Um, how, how what do you give those adult trick or treaters? Uh, it's gonna be another teaser for people uh, who are <laughs> going to directions. <laughs> so, uh, but I'll try to explain it. But the, the concept we try to use, um, we don't want to give people just another pen or notebook or whatever, something that'll just get somewhere lost in their in their bags. We try to make it a bit more exclusive. Um, so this year, year we are focusing on a, a certain fashion accessory, which we will uh, be giving away at our uh, our booth. And we try to make it something that you would, uh, would also wear or use in your daily life. So something that is very, try to keep it classy, not too tacky, not with a huge logo and, and to no socks no <laughs> that's already uh there are some other partners who are doing the socks already so we have done something uh different this time so we just we try to keep it um a bit more exclusive and a bit more classy that's that's what we are really trying to focus on as we also try to do with our um full branding so we try to make sure it's always quite sleek um and we try to uh make sure we do the same things with our giveaways very cool um i i think uh now now i'm really have to follow because i'm like what accessory can this be um but but uh super important that it reflects your brand as well you just don't want to give something to give something or if you do that's that's fine but you need to have something it has to fit in your whole overall strategy as well and um do you have something lingering on your desk that from a past trade show that uh you're like oh this this is cool it, it's made it to sitting on my desk or anything like that I do have a, a nice water bottle um, that yeah. I got from a partner we are working with, but like a, also a very, I think it's a very expensive one. So you can see it's really, it's a, uh, it's great quality. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, that's something I would, I would keep because it's, it comes in handy and it, it looks nice. So that's what we try to recreate as well. Oh, very cool. And Julia, what about you? Favorite Chotsky and what is your strategy when it comes to, you know, the adult trick-or-treaters? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think it changes every year. We have the normal things. Uh, we like food at our place. And so we share a lot of snacks, um, which I think people appreciate. Uh, healthy snacks. Um, I tried to get my, I tried to get them to put our logo on bananas and oranges, but they were not for that. I thought that was going to be a good giveaway, but they were not for that. But just some other things I've done for past clients or past shows, I think it's important that people um, think about ways to get them there. It might not be the tchotchke. It might, you know, I, things we've done before. We've had an author for a book in the industry come and sign for two hours and talk to people. And the first 50 people there get a free copy of the book signed. Um, so we've done those kinds of things. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, in our emails that one of the things we did was um, philanthropic. We did a door drop to everybody in the hotel and we um, gave them peanut butter. And then every one that came down, we also made a donation, including the peanut butter that they brought to the food bank in the city we were in. Wow. Um, so that was really popular um, because then people felt like they were also part of the philanthropic um, um you know, uh, situation with us. And so um, some things we've also done, we had a lock and key that was a door drop that was very popular um, where people could bring the key down, see if it opened the lock. Um, we didn't realize how popular it would be. It was very, very popular. We gave away pretty much everything and then went out and got more gift cards. So um, that was really popular. So just getting people to the booth in an interesting way. I think there are interesting ways without it, there being um, a tchotchke. But we usually try, if there is a one big thing giveaway, like in Summit Land or that kind of thing, we try to tie it to our booth. And so we have a really great giveaway. I'm also not going to say what it is this year um but last year it was popular we gave away a virtual reality set um but we had that in our booth too so it kind of tied back 
Um, so I think just interesting ways to have movement and activity and also think about uh, just getting people to the booth, not necessarily for a tchotchke. So many things that I love. One, um, giving out fruit that's covered. So, you know, maybe it's the coast COVID me, but um, things that you, you know, people who put their hands into M&M buckets, like I, I can't do that anymore. So yes, <laughs> closed fruit. I, I, I would have been good with an orange with a sticker on it. <laughs> um, and also that, that notion of experience, I think we're all looking for that and what drives people to your booth. So I think those are all super cool ideas. And I'm sure people were, were taking notes on how to make it an experience and how to, um, tie the two together. And they, it's it's an extra step to like find you do it and and win a prize after love it um uh, I'm looking I'm all about the experimental marketing so even if this is an ERP um world where we, we say that it's not as interesting so I'm seeing the time um we are almost at the end uh, what trends do we see for the upcoming trade shows uh we saw one shift pre-COVID, another shift after. I don't even know if we should be saying the C word anymore, but um, what do you see coming up as some game changers in the market these days? And so let's take us home. What what do you think? What does your crystal ball say? Okay. Um, so I, uh, well, I think it's a quite obvious one, but more and more um, the crossover between the physical and of course the, uh, the online world. So where you get... Um, yeah, both people to follow trade shows online as well as just experience them when you're um, on the conference uh, itself. And I think also, um, as Julia mentioned, they are doing some philanthropic things. So uh, sustainability is also a big, uh, big hype, a big thing I see with uh, mm -hmm. with lots of people. So I guess that's also going to be a trend where um, I guess many boots will be giving out sustainable giveaways um, and things like that. Um, and then of course. Maybe the biggest one and most important one is that in the, well, as we mentioned before, in this, this world, we get loads and loads of content just shot right at us. And uh, it's very hard to process that. And we often get uh, things that are relevant. So making sure it's hyper-personalized um, to people, I guess that's going to be a very, very big and important trend for uh, the upcoming trade shows. Love all three of those. And um it ties so well into everything else that we said earlier today. And I, I think we forget that the trade show or the event that we're going to isn't that one moment in time. It really is a 360 of everything that's going around from before to after. And how do you bring in your, like your, your digital, um, uh, your your digital um, tactics into that. How do you stay consistent throughout the year? What is your target market? Who are you looking at? And, let's take it away with us today that it really is the amount of money that we're investing in this. It's so important that we look at the bigger picture. And uh, we have a last question that snuck in right at the buzzer. Is it worth getting a bigger booth versus a better location? Ooh, um, does anyone have anything that they want to say on their topic? I personally would spend um, that extra money on uh, some kind of promotion to get them there. Something that's unique, something that's different, something that nobody else will do. Um, my most recent one I'm trying to talk Argon and Co into is um, puppies at the booth because they're stress reducers. <laughs> so if you could do that, that would be amazing. Um, so I, you know, just thinking out of the box and using that money towards uh, something that people don't see all the time. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. Recommend. Anyone else? Booth or, yeah. booth or location? Location. Definitely location. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think, it's uh, like real that's... estate. Yeah, it's location, location, <laughs> location. Exactly. <laughs> Which is why you want to plan a year out so you can yeah. have better the location. Best location. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, if you just, if you get uh, much more people just dropping by and you can deliver content, I think you can uh, deliver as good as content with two people than with 10 people. Um, we, of course, you might be able to talk to more people when your uh, your booth is being manned by uh, by multiple people, but sometimes it's just about the, the quality of uh, offices as well. So I guess uh, I would go for location, definitely. 
And if there's a puppy in the booth, like I don't think I'd ever leave. So yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm like I'm a dog person. Oh, I I might get canceled now by all the cat people out there, but yeah, no, no puppies in the booth. Um, there's uh, we have a couple more minutes. Do you prefer to go to one? go to one big conference or do you per, perhaps go for uh, a be consistent presence at uh, some like smaller meetups and stuff throughout the year? So go big once a year or smaller meetups throughout the year. Does anyone have a, have I feel a preference? like that depends on the marketing strategy, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it depends on goals on strategy for the organization on whether or not they're um, trying to go one way with things or another, because different size shows definitely offer different things. Um, so I would maybe look at strategy and figure out where I can talk to people. It might not be the most people, but they might be really qualified at a smaller event. Yeah. Anyone else before we close this up? Just to add to that, if I may, um... I think once this, once you commit to an event, though, it's kind of important that you go consistently if it works for you. Because um, some of these events, if you stop if you stop showing up, it's as if you don't exist. So it becomes a double edged sword. Um, that's all I would say about that as well. Yeah, I think that's something so so tricky when we're when we're looking at this is when we're calculating our ROI. Are we doing this? for awareness and visibility, or are we doing this really as a lead gen? And then I think all of our other strategies kind of lean into, why am I going? Do I need the big booth? Do I need, you know, puppies in my booth? The answer is yes, everyone needs puppies in their booth. But, um, you know, how, what do we want to do from, from that side of it? Um, oh, look at all these last qu minute questions coming in. They saw that we have a couple minutes left. How do you feel about the expense of sponsoring parties at events? Have you guys ever done it before? And what are your feelings on them? I'd say it uh, when you have the budget, you should uh, try to do it, but also again, make it um, make it creative. Don't do just another dinner party or whatever, because then um, we are also an implementation partner. Um, so I work in a large IT group. We are an implementation partner. When I go to directions, I get... Uh, 10 invites for every evening to go to a dinner party. Uh, and then it gets very hard to uh, to pick the right one. So I'd say, um, yes, definitely make sure you do some, um, some stuff after the conference, but make sure it's something that people would want to go to uh, and not just another dinner. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll say something towards that as well. Uh, from a previous life, we used to sponsor a lot of big group events. I think it comes back to what are you going to do with that list afterwards? If if you're not, if you don't have a strategy of how you're going to um, use it afterwards, um, I I would put that money into something more maybe in like intimate or to a, a key group of people. If if you're not, and also it depends on what what kind of audience are you going mm -hmm. after. If you're vertically based versus horizontally, um, you might not get the reach you want uh, when sponsoring big events like that. Um, but I am very jealous that you're so popular that you get invited <laughs> with all these things because I'm like, what am I doing wrong? Um, Anywho, we're going to end on that note of Tanya being unpopular. And I want to thank you all for, for being a great bunch today on, on our call. Um, I will be shamelessly plugging that next month is building, promoting, and repurposing webinars. So I think that's a good segue from, you know, going to the event and how do you invite people for more detailed topics after you've come to the event. So that is gonna be on October 28th from two to 3 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so it's gonna be after the the first big push of, of uh, events. So I think that'll be very timely as well. And um, we have just had a spot open up. So if you wanna be a speaker for this event or you have some cool things to say or interesting things to say about repurposing webinars, we are more than happy to invite you um you can ask the others i don't think i'm i'm i ask that you know too hard of a questions or um i promise it'll be an enjoyable hour with me so um or if you want to you know check out some other sessions before if you missed one before good excuse or bad one they're all um 
all uploaded to channelmarketingacademy.com. So please go check them out. Sharing is caring. So please share it with other people in your in your department or other people around you and spread the word because this is how um, we, we support each other. We are a big support group for everyone in the ERP space. So thanks again, everyone. Have a good one. See you next month. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Bye.